All right, I want to talk to you today about Ethereum, Ethereum's scaling. Um, uh, uh, Vitalik gave a great talk here at uh, Beyond Block, Taipei 2017. I'll give you the link. I think this is a great um, talk to listen to the whole thing. If you're an investor in Ethereum, to understand where it's going, this video answers a lot of questions. To me, it also introduced a few questions that I will pose to you. I've talked about it before. How important is extreme decentralization? It really is what the question comes down to. We'll get to that in a minute. First, let me give you a few clips of what some of the things Vitalik says here. First of all, he starts with his bold statement. Look, the Ethereum killer is Ethereum. The Ethereum of China is Ethereum. The Ethereum of Taiwan is Ethereum. <laughs> 2.0. So he's going to talk about how, you know, one thing I think a lot of people do when they're comparing and saying, you know, this is something is going to be better than Ethereum. People take a look at Ethereum today and its speed and its current architecture. And then they say, well, this new thing is going to be much better when it launches and becomes decentralized a year from now, two years from now. Well, you can't compare Ethereum today to your dream of some new platform in a year from now. Where is Ethereum going to be a year from now? So just as I think it's easy for people to look at a new platform that's going to launch and think of how amazing it can be. Uh, whereas when you look at Ethereum, you think of well, what it is today and you can't imagine that a year from now, it could also be a lot more powerful than it is now. And you got to, you know, the timing is everything in comparing apples to apples. You have to put your timing together. I think a lot of people forget that. So this is talking about where Ethereum may be a year from now. Now, uh, this this is kind of important here. I often talk about the some um, scalability trilemma, where I say that blockchain systems like have to trade off between different properties, and it's very hard for them to have three things at the same time, where one of them is decentralization, the other is scalability, and the third is security. So this helped me sort of understand what's going on with a, lo a lot of blockchains, uh, you know, smart contract or not, uh, you know, uh, Ethereum. Another thing to remember to compare is Ethereum is Turing complete. You can do a lot of smart contract things with non-Turing complete. And that's great. But if you want Turing complete, that's, that's Ethereum and, and, you know, that, that's another question of how many application, important applications can be done with non-Turing complete and how many require Turing complete smart contracts. Uh, and, and Ethereum obviously is, is Turing complete. But anyways, when we're talking about competitors, this topic of decentralization is what kind of comes up because what Vitalik talks about, in fact, I have another video here. Is that this one? Yeah, let's just hear this before I go on about it. He talks a little bit more about decentralization. Thousands of transactions per second. This is what they what Vitalik wants for Ethereum on the main chain. This is the ultimate goal. Thousands of transactions per second. On chain, without super nodes, master nodes, you know, crazy server nodes, cons like consortium chains or any of that stuff. At least So Vitalik is he is obsessed with full decentralization wants the entire Ethereum platform to be able to run on every all, all, nothing but laptops. That is decentralized. And so he, he's like, in fact, I got one more quote here where he talks about how he hates masternodes. So my usual notation for scalability here is that the letter C basically represents how much computing power one single node has, right? So remember, we hate masternodes. And so we want Ethereum to theoretically be able to exist and process Visa scale transaction levels with nothing but a set of consumer laptops, right? So, so that's the goal. That's certainly decentralized. His reasoning for this extreme decentralization is you then therefore cannot kill it. Now, but the question that I come to is like, is that necessary? You know, I think it's harder to make this platform fast and grow and powerful running on all consumer laptops. Now, if you succeed at that, that makes it, it's a big decentralization. The reason I got into blockchain and bought Bitcoin in the first place, I've always had, I don't know about always, for a long time, I've had a belief that it's a general philosophy that 
uh, an organization, a decentralized organi organization, will grow faster and become larger than a centrally organized one that's trying to do a similar thing. Now, but I never really got into the question of how decentralized does it need to be? I understand the difference between decentralized and centralized, but there's a lot of gray area now. So, for example, you know, I don't Dash has master nodes. I don't know. They probably have thousands of master nodes. That's a, like a layer of centralization over the non master nodes. I don't know. I mean, that's decentralized. It's not centralized. It's decentralized, but it, you know, it, Vitalik hates master nodes. So he hates that. I don't know. Why is that that bad? I mean, I understand the risks. There's a couple risks that I understand. Now, and let me just say one other thing. Uh, you know, so that's Dash. EOS would be almost, EOS is maybe the extreme to decentralized that's close to centralized. They, their plan is to have 12 data centers running the network. So it's 12. It's not centralized. It's 12. Um, I don't know. You know, Vitalik may say, well, governments could shut down them, could shut them down. And it's like, you know, yeah, I guess so. But like, why is the government trying to shut it down? Maybe they'd want to regulate it, you know, but maybe there's a ton of applications that they're not really worried about someone trying to shut it down. Another concern that I have regarding semi, uh, what do you call it? Semi-centralized, like EOS. Remember, this is a whole, this is economics. Whoever's running that data center needs to make money. One of the 12 is going to be much better. They're going to get, start getting more money and grow larger. One of the 12 is stupid. It goes out of business. Like things, often businesses and industries tend to centralize just based on the economics of competition. So if you start with 12 over some number of years, it may be difficult to maintain the 12 because one or two become so good at what they do that they gain more power. Now, I don't know enough about EOS. Maybe they have some protections against that happening. I don't know. Decentralization in general is safer, but at what level is is Vitalik going too far with this goal of it being run all on laptops and to the point that it holds back the development of, um, of Ethereum? That is the question. Now, um, is this video here? Okay. So, but let's talk about his scaling. Now, on the other hand, maybe they're scaling fast enough. Their plan, and I love this plan, I kind of understand it, which is means it's really simple. Um, actually, it's not that simple, and I don't know that I fully understand it, but let me explain to you what, what they're going to do. I, I, I don't even know if I can play the video because it's hard to, but anyways, so you have Ethereum as it is now, and what they're doing, they have this validator manager contract which is within the chain, which allows them or somebody to create another uh, uh, Ethereum platform in a sense that has different, might be a proof of stake and have some other cool features that is as uh, Vitalik calls it, a separate universe. So you've got the Ethereum main chain and then you've got another universe and they could have hundreds of these other universes all working together in consensus but at the same time separate so that in a sense you can um, experiment with other platform um, methods. And someone asked at the end of this talk, it's like, well, this kind of eliminates forks. Because if you think about, I don't know that it's going to eliminate forks or contentious forks. But if you're in the Ethereum community and you're like, geez, I wish they would do this. I wish they would have you know, this type of proof of stake. And if, they, and if we had these features and those features, they could, in a sense instead of forking, use the validator manager contract to create their own version of Ethereum and let it run and they see how it does. And, and as Vitalik says, you have these different universes and if one is working, they can then bring it into the main chain or adopt it and somehow merge it in. It's a way to almost, one guy said, is this like split testing? Different, you know, and he's like, well, I don't know if you really need to split test, but you can test all these different features. So. One thing that we see uh, that I hear, um, like I said at the beginning here, is you know when there's a a new platform saying, "Oh, what, we're going to launch and it's going to have all of these amazing features that Ethereum doesn't have." Well, Ethereum can now also launch a new platform with all these amazing features 
that's also kind of part of the main chain. And if it works, if it's successful, sort of adopt it in. That's one reason to be an Ethereum investor is this Ethereum maximalist situ you know, idea that anything that's great out there to do that some competitor may do, Ethereum can easily copy it and adopt it into its system. Um, and that is pretty much true. And this sharding is a system to allow them to adopt new cool technologies. The only caveat I have, like I said, is the one cool technology that they will not adopt is masternodes, consortium change, and these, those other forms of creating a blockchain. And does that create, I don't know that that would destroy, I don't think EOS, if it's successful, destroys Ethereum, but it might just say that, well, Ethereum doesn't remain, it doesn't become the only game in town, there will be others with different structures. So, uh, we will see. Uh, what else did I have? Now, the other point to remember as well, when you're looking, thinking, you know, again, with this whole, I'm kind of talking about the idea that somebody is going to launch a new smart contract platform that will pass Ethereum is one another point to remember is that here we're looking at this is transactions let's look just in a year okay look at this from 50,000 to we're now up to almost a million transactions a day that is some incredible growth um so keep in mind that a when a new platform launches it, it's not just remember the best technology doesn't always win I think Betamax had better technology than VHS, for those of you old enough to remember that battle. Um, I, I believe there were operating systems with better technology than DOS, you know, Microsoft's. Um, and so it, 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 a lot of it comes down to getting businesses to adopt and build on your platform. And if it's slightly slower and a company's been investing for two years, like they're not going to jump ship for that, you know. Uh, or if it's just better marketing and a better team and, and or they believe in the future, whatever. It's more than just the best technology. And, and what the hardest part is getting lots of large businesses to make large long-term investments in your platform. Ethereum has that. So if some new platform launches and the technology looks awesome, well, can they get a, a, a new, uh, either a lot of new companies on or get some of these to leave and go to their platform and keep in mind with this growth rate okay so i mean let's let's again if you look at a year from 500,000 to a million i mean what is that growth rate that's like 2000% growth rate so if a new platform is going to launch what does their growth rate have to be to pass ethereum when Ethereum's growth rate is 2,000%, I mean, you better grow really fast. I don't know, you know, it's just like insane. So listen, at this point, everything's growing so fast. Probably there's a lot of winners out there maybe, uh, certainly in the short run. I, um, you know, but, uh, sorry. Um, I think, I think that's all I wanted to say for now. Let me know your thoughts. And, and also Cardano, actually, I just want to mention one second, because everybody, for some reason, this Cardano, um, so Cardano has not launched yet. Now, some of the technology with it, it's hard for me to understand why it's better than Ethereum. The questions for Cardano, for you Cardano fans, number one, A, it hasn't launched. When it, and when I say launch, keep in mind, so EOS, for just a little off topic, just launched their test now. In June, they're going to launch sort of like the real thing, but in one data center. When are they going to be in 12 data centers, which would be decentralized? So for me, when you say launch, when I say launched, I mean a decentralized platform that's actually decentralized. Neo, for example, and IOTA have launched, but they're not decentralized. They say they're going to be in the future. Well, when they become decentralized, then I, mean, I will pay attention. So when will Cardano be, you know, launched and decentralized i don't know but i really don't get into the prediction business that early until something has launched uh and, and like i said same thing with eos my eos might be awesome but i mean it's 
June, they're only launching with what like they're not, it's probably a year away before it's a real um you know decentralized is it smart contract i guess you call it a platform so um you know so for cardano i don't know i i'm not i don't know why everyone everyone loves you know everyone loves the um what's his name hopkins the, the guy who started it i don't know why um and nothing against him it's just like but if you're comparing personalities of genius it's like i don't know i think vitalik probably beats the, the hopkins but it, they may have a wonderful team Everyone's very, very confident in Cardano, even though it's. it looks to me like it's not, I mean, it certainly hasn't launched. I don't even know when exactly it's going to launch it. It's, uh, I'm not a tech guy. I'm sort of a business um, investor who understands technology, but not to the level that I can go in. And when they talk about the, this technical specifics of why Cardano is going to be much better, it's hard for me to to uh, apply that. So I'm waiting. I analyze things when we launch. This game is so early. In the old days with stocks, you couldn't invest, or someone like me and most of you watching couldn't invest, never mind until it launched, till the company was up for a while. You had angel investor, venture capital, private equity, IPO, and then the regular guys like you and me could get in. Now we're getting in. If you're investing now in Cardano, you're like angel investing. Yeah, if you're right, you make a lot of money. But you can get in at like venture capital level and still make a shitload of money if you're right. So I wait till things launch. Okay. So, you know, let's let's stay tuned. And we're watching for the winners. And with this Ethereum horse so far in front, running so fast, if someone's gonna catch it, we'll see them coming because that's gonna be a horse that's moving real fast. All right. Thank you.